okay. weapon systems or, if you will, kill mechanisms which use, if you will, electromagnetic effects. Okay. And there are several ways to look at this. One, uh, something like a, a radio frequency weapon or a laser type device or um, an artillery piece that uses not um, chemical propulsion but electromagnetic propulsion. That is what some people have referred to uh, as rail guns or whatever. Obviously, the electromagnetic spectrum is used in war in the form of electronic warfare, cyber war, etc. But I'm, my understanding is you want to focus on the former, that is, weapon systems that emerge out of the use of electromagnetic forces or capabilities. Yeah, I think that's a topic that everybody seems to be talking about in the service. So I want to get some granularity. I mean, who's really looking at the, the, those types of weapons? Are, are they in, you know, what's kind of the, what's the driver of that? Right. Okay. Um, I, the short answer is, is, is actually fairly straightforward at the moment, is the major player in the development of directed energy weapons is the U.S. Navy. Uh, for two purposes. One is to develop an improved uh, self-defense capacity against guided missiles, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, drones, whatever, for its surface warships. And in that regard, it's made some meaningful progress and is deploying an early version of what is known as a solid-state laser for close-in defense. This is not Star Wars. Mm. This is not some gigantic Oh, uh, death ray, if you will, designed to shoot down long-range ballistic missiles. That, that technology is pretty well uh, in abeyance. The last big effort in that regard was an Air Force program, which was the Airborne Laser, and that was canceled uh, by the former Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, because of cost, military effectiveness, and other issues. Okay. The Quite other dimension that the Navy is pressing to develop and this is frankly, I think from a technological point of view, higher risk, and that is to use electromagnetic energy to propel, in essence, shells from a new kind of artillery piece, which mm -hmm. doesn't use chemical energy, but uses electromagnetic energy to propel shells out to, let's say, one or 200 miles. Mm -hmm. This would replace, ultimately, the current naval guns that are on board our destroyers mm -hmm. that would provide the Marine Corps with improved a naval gunfire support. Hmm. Um, that technology is being pushed uh, by the naval research community um, and they hope to have a prototype operational, a test hmm. gun, if you will, on board, I believe, a barge sometime at the end of this decade. Hmm. But that effort uh, is likely to take some time to emerge and obviously, like any new technology, uh, the engine here is how much money do you put into it. Right. And in a world of austerity, budgetary austerity, something new and exotic uh, may not get very much uh, money now where maybe five years ago would have gotten a lot more money. So do you see this going into some of the new LCS types of ships or where do you think that type of gun might? The laser okay. weapon, interestingly enough, is designed to supplement or complement the current close-in defense weapon, mm -hmm. uh, which is the close-in weapons system, or CWIS, which is basically a Gatling gun, a rotary-fired mm -hmm. 20-millimeter cannon, which is on board all of our warships, mm -hmm. and the LCS is so equipped. It is possible if this short-range laser is successful and proves to be uh, operationally valuable. The first mm -hmm. one, by the way, is being deployed in the Persian Gulf as we speak mm -hmm. in a sort of test run. Mm -hmm. If it proves itself out, then over time, the LCS might be armed with this weapon as opposed to the CWIS, or more conventional, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, rotary cannon weapon. Mm -hmm. So what's the distance when you're talking about distance? Uh, range, uh, the range. effectiveness. We're talking about really measuring it in uh, no more than five miles, probably, mm -hmm. uh, standoff. Because mm -hmm. these, again, are designed to, sh to shoot down weapons that have come quite close to mm -hmm. threatening an individual warship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's quite a distance. That's uh, going to be, I would think, kind of challenging because the beam has to be stable. Be stable. And in and the Persian Gulf, as you well know, you have high humidity. So again, mm -hmm. this will be <clears throat> one of the practical operational issues about how well does this work in a real world operational environment. Uh, and that's been one of the downfalls of some of the very long range mm -hmm. laser weapons 
is operating inside the atmosphere, is mm. atmospheric distortion. That's what drove the Air Force, sensibly, to put its laser, if you will, weapon on board an aircraft that basically overflies the weather. Right. But um, that was a chemically driven laser, mm. and one of the problems it had was um, you can carry almost so much, so much chemical fuel to fire the laser. Right. So you had this sort of the same limitation of you only had so many rounds, if you will, to shoot. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with the big 70, 747 concept, it carried a very limited number of shots. Mm -hmm. And so then that raised questions about how many of these aircraft would you really need to have a militarily, <coughs> excuse me, effective capability. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that type of weapon could be used in space in the sense of maybe downing some threatening satellite? Is, is that real? Oh, this is the old Star Wars um, yeah. thing. I, I, my view about all of this is that the most sensible thing for us to do is to not to imagine we're going to <coughs> have, if you will, mm. space war yeah. or self-defense capacities mm. for our satellites, but figure out ways in which our military can operate mm. in an environment with those satellite arrays sure. that we are dependent upon, mm. we can do without them. or operate in an environment where they've been badly degraded, either mm -hmm. by electronic warfare, cy mm -hmm. war through cyberspace, or somebody else, as they say, mm -hmm. damaging or destroying them in space. So from your professional perspective, I mean, is this a realistic thing, or this is kind of like futuristic? I mean, does it make any sense to you, just uh, from your, you know, your research in this area and, and your you know, professional opinion? I, I, think, I think the naval plan, especially the short end laser, uh, I think this is again going to be one of those proof in the pudding is in the eating, mm -hmm. that is, uh, and it's not su super ambitious mm -hmm. in the sense of what it's being asked to do. Uh, it has a very well-defined mission that is immediate protection mm -hmm. of a warship from these various threats, mm -hmm. and it's probably feasible. Electromagnetic gun, I think that's a bigger and more speculative e effort as to whether you can get a gun that can shoot multiple shots mm -hmm. and won't have major mm -hmm. power and cooling problems even for a large warship. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, there's such a great connection between uh, the United States Department of Defense and NATO. So do you see this uh, being put on one of the NATO ships over at Norfolk, for example, uh, you know, this type of weapon, uh, say if the Persian Gulf test proves good, uh, do you see that uh, eventually they might put that on a... Well, I could imagine it's, if it proves to be very successful and provides mm -hmm. a materially better self-defense capability mm -hmm. than the current generation of short-range mm -hmm. anti-aircraft weapons, mm -hmm. um, that what we're talking about is, there, is an, a global marketing opportunity. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and then the question is, how rapidly will NATO European navies right. acquire this technology? And the reality is, is that most of those navies are under extreme budgetary stress. Mm -hmm. So my suspicion is, even if it looks like a dramatic improvement, you won't see them showing up on, let's say, the Royal Navy or right. the French Navy quickly. Right. So what about ad adversaries? Do you think they might be sitting in their R&D uh, working on something like this? Because, you know, everybody uh, is amazed how fast uh, our adversaries are uh, getting countermeasures or getting similar types of weapons. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, this type of technology, we, we might find it in our po uh, future potential adversaries? Well, yes. I mean, the logical place would be, will the People's Liberation Navy acquire, acquire this weapon? For the same reasons our Navy is, because they're now building a number of very high value ships like mm -hmm. their first aircraft carrier mm -hmm. and they have the same military problem that we will face mm -hmm. not just from US forces but mm -hmm. for example the Japanese or the South Koreans or the right. Taiwanese will have an increasingly sophisticated array of anti-ship weapons mm -hmm. uh, anti-ship guided missiles and so therefore they have the same military motivation mm -hmm. to develop these kinds of short-range weapons mm -hmm. Whether they have bigger ambitions like the old Star Wars to build very high-powered uh, laser or other electromagnetic weapons that could be used, for example, as an ASAT weapon, etc., um, we'll see.